Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this Medical Center Hour. This is a program entitled, Is There Life After Death? 50 Years of Research at UVA. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, and we're delighted to produce the Medical Center Hour and bring it to you each week uh, during the academic semesters. Um, I would quickly ask that there are a few, a couple of seats still left. Uh, anybody sitting on the stairs, uh, I would encourage you please to find a seat because the fire marshal who sometimes visits us doesn't <laughs> approve of um, people hmm. sitting in the stairs. Does some aspect of our personality survive bodily death? Long a philosophical and theological question, in the 20th century, this became the subject of scientific research. 50 years ago this year in 1967, Dr. Ian Stevenson, then chair of UVA's Department of Psychiatry, created within the department a research unit now known as the Division of Perceptual Studies to study what, if anything, of the human personality survives after death. Dr. Stevenson's own research investigated hundreds of accounts of young children who claimed to recall past lives. In our Medical Center Hour today, one of our History of the Health Sciences lectures, faculty from the Division of Perceptual Studies highlights this unit's research initiatives since its founding. They will also preview the unit's priorities and partnerships for its second half century. We are delighted to welcome four presenters to cover this span of studies. On my immediate right, Jim B. Tucker, who is the Bonner Lowry Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral, Neurobehavioral Sciences. He's also the director of the division. Next is Bruce Grayson, Chester Carlson Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences. Um, third is Kim Penberthy, the Chester Carlson Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences. And finally, on my far right, uh, Ed Kelly, Research Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences. They will be presenting in this order. By way, quickly, of some historical background, I'll mention that the Medical Center Hour in past years um, often addressed the Division of Perceptual Studies research especially Ian Stevenson's internationally known studies of children with possible past lives. And indeed, Ian presented here multiple times uh, about his work. His research, like that of his successors in the division, is, I think, especially noteworthy for the scientific rigor with which it was performed. Indeed, Dr. Stevenson's standard for impeccable science was extraordinarily high and it even continuously challenged him in his own work. Um, I'd like to say that today's program is co-presented with the historical collections of the Health Sciences Library and with the Department of Psychiatry and Neural Behavioral Sciences here at UVA. Um, all of the speakers have completed disclosure forms and none had conflicts of interest to disclose. So we'll start with Dr. Tucker. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as you have heard, we are going to try to cover a fair amount today. Um, I'm going to start by telling a little bit about the history of our division, and then we'll each talk about one particular area of research, and mine will be uh, this work that Marcia mentioned that Dr. Stevenson began uh, with young children who report memories of past lives. Uh, as she said, we do not have anything to disclose as far as um, uh, conflicts of interest. Um, so, the story begins with Ian Stevenson, and he came here to be the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry in 1957. At that point, he was in the middle of, of quite a successful mainstream career. Uh, he had nearly 70 publications to his credit at that point. Uh, but he also had an interest in parapsychology. And after he had been here a while, uh, he heard about these cases of children from various parts of the world who describe memories of a past life, and he decided to go investigate those cases. Um, he was able to 
fund that travel uh, with the help of Chester Carlson, uh, which is a name you've already heard with people holding the Chester Carlson chair. Uh, Chester Carlson invented the Xerox machine. So he was quite wealthy and he became a big supporter of Ian's. Um, so in 1967, uh, with Carlson's help, Ian was able to step down as chairman of the department and establish the, what we now call the Division of Perceptual Studies. Um, so that this year marks our 50th year anniversary uh, and we've been going strong ever since then. And most of the time, uh, we were, our home was this old clapboard house on Wortland Street, uh, which is now student housing. Um, <laughs> A few years ago, we moved to our current home, which is near the downtown mall. And uh, we certainly don't occupy the entire building. Uh, but we do have the Ian Stevenson Memorial Library there, uh, which has over 5,000 books in it. And we also have a neuroimaging lab. Um, and as for Ian, uh, once he established the division in, in 1967, he spent the bulk of the next 40 years uh, focused on these cases of, of children reporting past life memories. Uh, he published numerous books and, and papers about them. Uh, one of his books was reviewed in JAMA, and it was actually reviewed by the book review editor, uh, who wrote, in regard to reincarnation, he has painstakingly and unemotionally collected a detailed series of cases from India cases in which the evidence is difficult to explain on any other grounds. He has placed on record a large amount of data that cannot be ignored. So to tell you a little bit about this phenomenon, uh, we have now studied over 2,500 cases from <coughs> around the world. Uh, they are easiest to find in cultures with a belief in reincarnation, but they have been found wherever anyone has looked for them. Uh, they have been found on all the continents uh, except Antarctica. And they typically involve very young children who spontaneously start talking about a past life and a recent ordinary past life. These kids are not claiming to be Cleopatra or Julius Caesar or anything like that, uh, just describing somebody who lived and died. Uh, the one part of the life that's often out of the ordinary is how the previous person died. In over 70% of the cases, the previous person died by unnatural means, meaning murder, suicide, uh, accident, combat, that sort of thing. Um, and often the kids, in, in fact, in most of the cases that we've investigated, the kids give enough details uh, so that people have been able to confirm that somebody did actually live and die whose life matches the details that the child gave. Now, along with the statements, uh, the children often show emotional or behavioral features that seem connected to the, the material they're describing, uh, and I'll give you an example of that in a minute. In addition, some children even have birthmarks or birth defects that matched wounds, usually the fatal wounds, on the body of the previous person. And Ian studied a lot of these cases. Uh, one was a little girl who remembered the life of a man who got his fingers chopped off as he was being murdered, and the little girl was born with her hands looking like that. Uh, there was a boy who remembered the life of a boy in another village who had lost the fingers of his right hand in a fodder chopping machine, and the second little boy was born with his hands looking like that, which is quite an unusual defect. Uh, and then there was a boy who remembered uh, the life of a man who had been killed by a shotgun blast to the side of his head. And the little boy was born with just a stump for an ear and an underdeveloped right side of his face. Uh, Ian also listed 18 cases in which <coughs> children were born with two birthmarks ones that matched both the entrance wound and the exit wound uh, on the body of, of a uh, gunshot victim. Now, in recent years, we have focused more on American cases. And we can now say with certainty that this is not purely a cultural phenomenon that takes place in, in areas with a belief in reincarnation. 
uh, because we have lots of American cases, and most of them take place in families uh, who had never believed in reincarnation before the children started talking about a past life. Um, so I want to uh, give you an example of a case, and, and then I'll turn things over to Bruce. Uh, this is a case that uh, got some publicity a few years ago. Uh, it's a little boy named James Leininger. Oh, he's not so little anymore, but uh, James was the son of a Christian couple in Louisiana, and his dad in particular was quite opposed to the idea of, of reincarnation uh, before all of this started. But around the time of his second birthday, James started having horrible nightmares multiple times a week in which he would be kicking his legs up in the air and screaming, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. And during the day, he would take his little toy airplanes and he would say, airplane crash on fire and bam, he would slam them into the family's coffee table. He did this over and over again, and, and his parents uh, are apparently tolerant people because uh, their coffee table had dozens of scratches and dents from airplane crash on fire, bam. So when you uh, add that play to the nightmares that he was having, he really looked like a traumatized child. Uh, but he had not experienced any trauma, uh, at least in this life. And then a little while after his second birthday, uh, his parents were able to have several conversations with him uh, during the day in which he could talk about these things. And he said how his plane had crashed on fire, uh, how he had been shot down by the Japanese, and he said that he flew a Corsair. Now, I'd never heard of a Corsair, but... Um, it was a special plane that was developed during World War II. Then when he was 28 months old, he said one day that his plane had flown off of a boat. And his parents asked him the name of the boat, and he said, Natoma. And it turns out that there was a USS Natoma Bay that was stationed in the Pacific during World War II. Then when he was two and a half, uh, his father bought this book on Iwo Jima to give to his own father, uh, James's grandfather, uh, for Christmas. And he was looking through it one day when James came and got in his lap. And they were thumbing through it, and they got to this page, and James pointed at the picture and said, that's where my plane was shot down. And his dad said, what? And he said, my airplane got shot down there, Daddy. And that just floored his dad that his two-and-a-half-year-old was talking like that. And then he learned that, in fact, the Natoma Bay did take part in the Iwo Jima operation. Then when James got old enough to draw, he drew dozens and dozens of pictures of planes and battle scenes, and he always signed in James III and said that he was the third James. Well, eventually, with all this going on, his dad did begin to wonder if he was remembering a past life. So when James was four and a half, he went to a Natoma Bay reunion. Uh, and he learned that one and only one pilot from the ship had been killed during the Iwo Jima operation. Uh, this was a young man from Pennsylvania uh, named James Houston. So what we can do is compare what James Leininger said to James Houston's life to see how well they match. Um, now, James's parents said that he also talked about family life before the war, but we don't have documentation of those statements that was made before Houston was identified. Uh, but what we do have here, this is a list of items where we do have definite documentation made before anyone knew anything about James Houston. So, James signed his drawings James III. Houston was James Jr., which would make James Leininger the third James. James said he flew off the Natoma. Houston was the pilot on the USS Natoma Bay. James said he flew a Corsair. Houston had flown a Corsair. He was actually flying a different plane when he was killed, but he was part of the squadron that tested the Corsair for the Navy. James said he was shot down by the Japanese, and Houston was shot down by the Japanese. 
James said he died at Iwo Jima. Houston was the one and only in the Toma Bay pilot killed during the Iwo Jima operation. James said one day, quote, my airplane got shot in the engine and crashed in the water and that's how I died. Eyewitnesses reported that Houston's plane was, quote, hit head on right on the middle of the engine. James had nightmares of his plane crashing and sinking in the water and Houston's plane crashed in the water and quickly sank. And James said one day that his friend Jack Larson was there and Jack Larson was the pilot of the plane next to Houston's on the day that he was killed. Uh, James is now 18 years old. Uh, he graduated from high school last spring and he has now joined the Navy. So with that, I will turn things over to Bruce Grayson. Thank you, Jim. Among the phenomena that we've been studying at the Division of Perceptual Studies, or DOPS, for the past 40 years have been ex near-death experiences, or NDEs. Many people, when they come close to death, report unusual and profound experiences in which they appear to have left their bodies and claim to have moved beyond the boundaries of time and space. These NDEs have been recorded in a variety of ancient cultures. You can find them in the writings of Plato, in the Bible, in writings from Tibet, India, Egypt, China, Japan, and in the folklore of the South Pacific and Native Americans. The interpretation of these experiences varies from culture to culture, but the basic phenomena remain the same across the globe and across the centuries. These experiences near death were recorded in medical literature in journals in the 19th century. And they were described as a discrete syndrome in 1892 by Hein. They were written about quite a bit in French academic journals in the 1890s when Victor Egger gave them the term near-death experiences. That term became popular in English in 1975 when a book was written by a UVA intern named Raymond Moody called Life After Life. There remains some controversy now about what causes NDEs and what their ultimate meaning is, but there's no question about their incidence or their impact on people. A variety of studies here at UVA and in Europe and the UK suggest that they occur to about 20% of people who have a documented cardiac arrest in study after study. We at UVA have developed a model of the NDE and a scale to quantify the depth of NDEs that's been used in hundreds of studies around the world. It basically looks at NDEs as being composed of four component parts. Changes in thought processes, changes in emotional states, apparently paranormal phenomena, and what seem to be otherworldly phenomena. The changes in thought processes include a sense of time being distorted. People often talk about uh, having a sense of timelessness thinking being faster and clearer than usual, having a life review or panoramic memory where your entire life flashes before your eyes, and a sense of sudden understanding or revelation where everything becomes crystal clear. The changes in feeling include a sense of peace and well-being, a feelings of joy, a sense of oneness or cosmic unity, and an encounter with what seems to be a loving, warm being of light. The apparently paranormal features include extraordinary sensory vividness. People report seeing colors they have never seen on Earth, hearing sounds they've never heard before, having what seems to be frank extrasensory perception of things going on elsewhere, visions of the future, and a sense of leaving the physical body. The otherworldly in features include being in an otherworldly uh, realm, an unearthly or mystical realm, encountering some mystical being or presence, seeing deceased spirits or religious spirits, and coming to a border or point of no return beyond which you can't come back. Now, most NDEs, in fact, have a combination of all four of these elements to varying degrees. As an example, let me give you the report of one woman who had the following experience. She said, during the war, I was very ill in the hospital. One morning, the nurse came in and found me showing no sign of life, whatever. She called the doctors, to whom I also appeared dead. 
and I remained so, they told me afterwards, for at least 20 minutes. I became aware of a brilliant light and felt drawn toward it. It seemed that time was different or non-existent there, wherever there was. The light was beautiful to look at and projected feelings of unconditional love and peace. Looking around, I found myself in a beautiful green undulating country. I then saw a young officer with a few soldiers approaching. The officer was my favorite cousin, Alvin. I did not know that he had died, nor had I ever seen him in uniform. But what I saw of him was confirmed by a photograph I had seen many years later. We spoke for a few minutes happily, and then he and the few men with him marched off. Then a presence beside me explained that these soldiers were allowed to go and greet others who were dying and help them meet their death. My next vivid recollection after this was of looking down from about ceiling height onto a bed on which lay a very emaciated body. There were white-coated doctors and nurses around it. I yelled out to them, but they couldn't hear me. I could see everything clearly and felt warm, safe, and peaceful. In a few moments, I was looking up at them and feeling a sensation of intense disappointment. I had come back from something so lovely and so utterly satisfying. Two days later, the doctor told me that I was lucky I didn't die. I told him that I did. <coughs> he looked at me in a strange way and scheduled me for psychological evaluation. <laughs> I learned to keep my mouth shut about that from that time on. Now, one of the problems we have in researching near-death experiences is that, for the most part, they're retrospective. We're getting accounts from people who had the experience at some time in the past. That leaves open the question of how reliable memories of NDEs really are. Some authors have speculated that memories are embellished over the years, and particularly that the sense of well-being and peace and the pleasantness of the experience gets embellished over time. Because we've been studying these experiences for four decades now, we're able to address this question. Starting in 2002, I started trying to reconnect with people I had interviewed in the 1980s about their near-death experiences and asked them to describe their NDEs for me again. What we found, oops, I'm going the wrong way here, is that the NDE scale scores measuring the depth of the NDE were the same now in the 2000s as they were in the 1980s. And that held true for all four of the components, changes in thinking, changes in feeling, paranormal, and transcendental. So memories of the NDE are indeed reliable over years. And that suggests that retrospective research is also reliable. Another important question about retrospective reports of NDEs is whether they're influenced by cultural beliefs. We know that people's cultural beliefs influence how they interpret their perceptions. We see what we expect. For example, near-death experiences in third world countries do not talk about entering a tunnel the way Americans do. They may talk about entering a cave or a well. One truck driver who I interviewed talked about entering a tailpipe. So you tend to use whatever cultural metaphors are at your disposal to describe the phenomenon. So our NDE is just reporting what they expect to happen when they come close to death. The image of NDEs that most people have nowadays is the one described by Raymond Moody in 1975. Now we've been collecting NDEs here at UVA since the 1960s, years before Moody's book came out. So we compared 24 experiences we collected in the 1960s with 24 recent experiences that were matched with the original ones in terms of age, race, gender, religion, cause of death, and proximity to death. What we found is that the features that Moody reported were reported just as often before the experience and after the experience. No matter what we looked at, the out-of-body experience, the feeling of peace, meeting others, a being of light, noises, or life review, all reported before Moody had described them as often as they are now. And that also held true for the after effects that Moody reported. Attitude changes, loss of fear of death, difficulty telling others, belief in survival after life, and corroboration of extrasensory perceptions. 
all reported as often before Moody described them as after. So reports do not seem to be influenced by the widespread public knowledge of NDEs, although the interpretation of the phenomena may be influenced by culture, the actual experience appears not to be. But even though these memories of NDEs are reliable and consistent over decades, that doesn't establish that their memories are real events rather than memories of fantasies or hallucinations. To test that possibility, we use the Memory Characteristics Questionnaire, which was designed to differentiate memories of real events from memories of imagined events. This memory characteristics questionnaire <clears throat> taps into five aspects of memories that reliably differentiate memories of real from imagined events. It includes the clarity of the memories, including the visual detail, sensory aspects like sound, smell, taste in the memory, contextual features like the memory for location and spatial arrangements, thoughts and feelings during the recalled event, and the intensity of feelings both during the event and now remembering it. We asked people who had come close to death to rate their memories of that event and also of real events that happened around the same time in their lives and also about an imagined event from that time in their lives. What we found is that for those people who had NDEs, the near-death experience was remembered with more clarity, more detail, more context, and more intense feelings than real events from the same time period. NDEs were recalled as realer than real events to the same degree that real events were remembered as realer than the imaginary events. On the other hand, people who did not have NDEs reported their close brush with death to be as real as other real events, but not realer. So NDEs are remembered with great consistency over decades and are recalled as realer than real. How do we explain them? There are no variables that we found yet that can predict whether someone's going to have an NDE, either age, race, gender, religion, religiosity, or mental illness. There's been lots of speculation about physiological variables that may be involved in NDEs, but the bottom line is that it's hard to reconcile enhanced mental function, thinking and perception being clearer and sharper than ever before, with impaired brain function as you have in deep anesthesia or cardiac arrest. So why are near-death experiences of interest to health professionals? One reason is that there is a consistent pattern of after effects from near-death experiences, changes in beliefs, attitudes, and values. And these have been corroborated with long-term studies and interviews with significant others. We see increases in spirituality, a sense of concern or compassion for others, appreciation of life, a sense of meaning or purpose, confidence and flexibility in your coping skills, and a belief in post-mortem survival. And along with these, we see decreases in fear of death, a decreased interest in material possessions, decreased interest in status, power, prestige, and fame, and decreased interest in competition. A second reason that NDEs are important to us is for what they suggest about survival of bodily death. As Dr. Tucker mentioned, our division was founded to explore the possibility that something may survive after death and NDEs do provide some evidence on that question. For example, we have enhanced cognition when the brain is impaired, such as by anesthesia or cardiac arrest, which suggests that the mind is not just what the brain does. Second, we have accurate perceptions from an out-of-body perspective. A recent review of over 100 published cases of people who had left their bodies during an NDE and reported seeing things showed that greater than 90% were 100% accurate. Further evidence of the potential independence of mind and brain. Third, we have accurate information that's imparted by deceased visitors in the NDE, such as the location of an important document or hidden treasure, which is evidence that these are encounters with interactive beings, not just mental images of the deceased. A striking example of this are NDEs in which the person meets in the experience someone who was not known at the time to be dead. An example was the experiencer I mentioned before, who saw her cousin Alvin, who had, she had not known had died. Of course, she did know that he was a soldier. So it's conceivable she could have imagined that he had died, but that's not always the case. 
We also had the NDE from a young girl, an only child, who almost died during heart surgery and said that in her near-death experience during surgery, she met someone who identified himself as her brother. When she told her father about this, he was so moved that he confessed to her that he had had a son she didn't know about who had died before she was born. We have identified dozens of cases of this type, some going back to ancient Greece. The bottom line is that our culture tends to talk about death as if it's the end, the end of all existence. But NDE suggests that it may be more like a change of state. <laughs> I'm going to turn things over now to Dr. Kim Pendergy. <laughs> I'm happy to follow the snowmen. I love that. Well, thank you. Um, I am Kim Pemberthy, and I am the newest member at DOPS, and I feel very honored to be part of this esteemed group and, and, and bring with me um, what I'm going to talk about now, which is some of the directions we're moving in. As you heard, there's been an extensive history of research in the area of near-death experiences and um, children who remember past lives. That's not all that we are doing, though, or have done. And so I'm going to describe to you a little bit, uh, very briefly, some of the work I'm doing, and, and, and then my colleague, uh, Dr. Kelly, will, will finish up. So the, the areas you've heard of are, are important because of the main question and mission that DOPS has, of this idea of survival, this idea of, of the relationship between what we call the mind and the brain, and are we more than just the bodies that we inhabit? Additional research thus builds in that area, uh, which would make sense. So the areas of research that we've um, strategically outlined and planned and, and sort of begun to collaborate in include areas that build upon this, including continued work in the areas you've heard about. We're also looking to expand and focus our research in the area of end of life. I work in the Cancer Center as a clinician. I'm a clinical psychologist working with palliative care. And we have a lot of questions about all the experiences of people while they were dying, the experiences of people who are working with the dying. And um, we'll hope to launch research in that area and, and begin hopefully this fall with a, a big event that we have. We also have uh, a strong background in in the neuroimaging field and have specific dedicated researchers to look at this. So the folks you've just heard about and you've heard alluded to, we can look at their, at their brains and look at what, what is going on um, with various imaging sort of strategies, including EEG, other neuroimaging um, capacities that we have, and we have brilliant people doing that work. So we're always looking for individuals where we can um, sort of use these techniques and develop our hypotheses and test them. We also are looking at the phenomena um, that exist um, where we can experience some of this ability without having a near-death experience or, or a memory of a past life. These are some extreme e examples that, that promote these things that Dr. Um, that the Bruce was talking about. And one of the areas of research for me is how can we um, achieve these sorts of states of mind, this level of consciousness, with intentionality? So not all of us will have a near-death experience. Not all of us will remember a past life. Does that mean we're excluded from this realm of understanding? And, and I don't believe that's necessarily the case. So my interests um, fold into what, what we've talked about, this idea of, of the, this optimistic idea uh, that, that we can achieve this. So one area of research that I have is looking at intentional strategies to develop these. Um, and understand this, this relationship between consciousness and the physical world. So I have currently got funding to look at the development of these skills and how they may be associated to people who are 
practicing mindfulness, meditation, various forms of yoga, and I'm collaborating with my colleagues at the Institute of Noetic Sciences in California, where we have some preliminary data to demonstrate that there seems to be an association. And um, the reality is, I mean, this is what some of these practices were developed for, or to enhance these abilities. And we often, in, in our modern day research, don't ask about them. So we might teach someone how to meditate and measure their blood pressure and see that their blood pressure went down, which is pretty darn amazing in and of itself. We don't ask them, however, did you notice if you were more intuitive or that you've had any kind of other extraordinary experiences? And, and if you, it turns out if you begin to ask people, many of them will report that. So we're now currently looking at prospectively monitoring this in, in cohorts here and in California. And, and looking at, again, in the tradition of DOPS, us in a scientific way, what we can find in that area. I have research looking at developing an, an inter, a mindfulness-based intervention for people with lupus. There have been very few developments in this area for decades, and uh, we were charged with this, uh, this task of looking at can doing a mindfulness exercise not only reduce the stress, improve fatigue, but can it actually change biological markers, uh, markers of immunological functioning or inflammation, IL-6, these sorts of things. And again, this is, this is a big deal if we can look at intentionally developing these skills in order to help ourselves that way and help other people. So through the research at DOPS, I, I would just like to emphasize what we do is we strive to challenge some of the entrenched mainstream views that may be held in medicine even and evaluate empirical evidence regarding consciousness and its relationship to the physical world, including our body. And, our, and, and, and the mind and the brain and, and looking at whether they are indeed distinct and separate. Um, this is the work we do and I'm going to hand it over to my colleague to discuss this a bit further because it's important to understand the ramification of what this might mean, not just for ourselves, our health, our well-being, but I would challenge you to think about for the future of our Earth and our people as a race. So thank you. So I'm going to try to uh, explain in the next five or six minutes the implications <laughs> of those two large books. Yeah, I'll stay here. Um, obviously, it's going to have to be very telegraphic, uh, but we put out brochures both down here and on the table outside where you can find us, find your way to our website, which contains lots more information, uh, and the real justification for some outrageous things that I'm now going to tell you. Um, my career kind of brackets what goes on uh, at DOPS. Uh, I'm a little different in background. I started out as an experimental psychologist studying psychology of language and cognitive science at Harvard in the 1960s. This is when we were recovering from the dark ages of behaviorism, beginning to realize that there are things like minds and consciousness and so on. Um, and uh, I mean, I had absorbed the view that most scientists held then and most do now, which is that basically mind and consciousness are generated by physiological processes going on in brains. Well, late in, the, late in the piece, when I was working on my dissertation, I became interested in experimental parapsychology. This had to do with some experiences involving my sister. And I learned to my amazement that there was a vast section of Widener Library devoted to the subject of psychical research, including a lot of experimental research that I'd never heard of before. And so I began reading it. and. Uh, eventually decided, well, this stuff looks really interesting, and if it really happens, something's fundamentally wrong with our basic scientific outlook. And so I decided uh, to sign up with J.B. Ryan down at, uh, in Durham. You know, he had been at Duke most of his career, but had moved off campus. 
And so I started there at the usual 400 bucks a month, six month trial period. <laughs> and uh, there were lots of idealistic young people who clamored to occupy those few slots. Uh, within a month, I met a guy who erased any doubts I still had about the existence of the basic phenomena that Ryan was studying. This guy could do basically anything we asked him to do. He succeeded at controlled psi tasks at prodigious levels of statistical significance. Uh, so the first take home lesson is, whether we like it or not, psi phenomena exist as facts of nature and science is gonna have to come to grips with that fact somehow. Um, I had also gotten interested because of some things we found out about this guy in the possibility of measuring brain waves in relation to his performance in these tasks. And I won't go into that in any detail, but uh, I'm happy to say that even though it kind of petered out at that time, this was in the School of uh, Engineering, Electrical Engineering Department at Duke, where I encountered my colleague, Ross Dunseith, over here, raise your hand. So we <laughs> spotted him, he was an undergraduate at the time. He's been with us ever since. Um, anyway, uh, that group was there. We made some headway, but the technology really was not up to it. We laid the kind of conceptual technical foundations, but couldn't do many of the things we hoped to do. We now have established at DOPS a really first class neuroimaging facility and can begin to do things now that we could only dream about back in the 1970s. Okay, but uh, now we come to the other part closer to this. Uh, I had to give up psycho research for a good long time, worked in neuroscience at UNC Chapel Hill, all, of, all the UVA enemies, right, the core. <laughs> um, yeah, and we did some good things there and continued to develop our EEG techniques and so on. But I was anxious to find a way back into the field and actually uh, married one of Ian's longtime research collaborators, Emily Williams, in 1998, and retired early and moved here in 2002 so that we could work intensely on the first book, Irreducible Mind. Now, the way that came about was that uh, Mike Murphy, who you may know as the co-founder of Esalen Institute out in Big Sur, California, which is now an island, apparently, by the way, due to the recent <laughs> storms, um, uh, he, I mean, he's an amazing man, much like Ian. In fact, we, we dedicated our book to Ian and Mike jointly, even though they never met in, in, in the flesh. Uh, they're both kind of um, descendants of the original founders of psychical research, that is, in the breadth of their scientific vision. Mike was well aware of the prevailing view in neuroscience and that if that view is correct, there can be no survival, period. And that's an inescapable fact. If mainstream view of production of mind and consciousness by physiological processes in the brain is correct, there can be no survival. That's the fundamental biological objection to survival. And it's been elaborated at ad nauseum in a recent book called The Myth of an Afterlife. Um, anyway, we, uh, we started by just reviewing evidence for survival, which Mike was very interested in. Well, we gradually realized that we needed to undertake a much bigger project in two stages. Irreducible Mind is the first stage where we assembled in one place a whole lot of empirical evidence that we think disproves the conventional view of mind-brain relations. We incorporated all of uh, the experimental parapsychology and survival research by reference. We didn't want to make it a book about science survival, but we wanted to use that evidence. So there's a big annotated bibliography in there. Uh, but we then went on to describe a variety of other well-documented empirical phenomena that are difficult or impossible to explain from a conventional point of view. And I won't go through it. They, they include things like extreme physiological influence, the manufacturing of things like stigmata or hypnotic blisters, even blisters having a specific geometrical form. Uh, they include in particular cases of the sort that uh, Bruce talked about, uh, Near-death experiences under conditions such as deep general anesthesia and or cardiac arrest. And those are crucial because these things are happening under conditions that 99% of contemporary neuroscientists uh, believe are, the conditions which neuroscientists believe are necessary for conscious experience have been abolished. 
and that can be shown categorically. The way we know that, that uh, they had the experiences during the time of unconsciousness is that they can sometimes report things correctly, things that happened during that period. And there are subtle arguments about all that, but that's the basic idea. Anyway, the net result of this whole exercise, and I have to finish within the next minute or two, uh, was to show that the, the correlations that exist between mental events and physical events, which we all accept, that, that's just how it is, can be interpreted in a different way. That is, that mind, consciousness, or something inherently larger than we normally know, that overflow the organism in some sense, but operate conditioned by the behavior of the brain and the sense organs and all the rest of it. Now, to me, that totally changed the landscape of the, or the conceptual territory of the survival discussion, because now we have a, a way of thinking about the mind-brain connection that allows for the possibility that mind can operate separately from the organism. To me, that eroded the biological obstacle to survival. Okay, well, now we've got that far in this little psychological way. What does it all mean in terms of our fundamental worldview? That was the second, much harder job, and we struggled with it for a long time, but finally put together a book that's remarkable at least for its authorship because we have physicists, scholars of religion, and philosophers all under the covers of one book. And to cut to the bottom line, the basic picture is one that seems to invert the currently popular view of relation between the physical and the mental uh, we have begun to think we're being driven towards some kind of an idealistic picture in which uh, mind is not derivative from matter, but if anything, the other way around. So it has fundamental implications for our basic vision of reality and our place in it. So I think I'll just stop there and we start questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for four wonderful presentations. Um, I dare say this is a mind-expanding <laughs> session. Um, and we are open to um, your comments and questions. Uh, we have a couple of mics we can bring to those of you who have questions. I would ask that you please identify yourself before you make your comment or ask your question. Um, and you may direct your question to any uh, or all of the presenters. Who would like to start? Bob. I'm Bob Reynolds, a retired professor of medicine here and used to be a vice president, and I find this material absolutely fascinating and mind-boggling. I'm reminded of a book made into a recent movie called Heaven is for Real, and it tells the story of a three- or four-year-old boy who has a ruptured appendix and I presume had a near-death experience, and as he gets older, he tells the family about what he experienced. Would you categorize this as one of your near-death experiences and, and uh, the, the story that came with it? Well, I would certainly characterize it as a near-death experience. There are a lot of questions about this particular case. He was a four-year-old boy, as I said, as you said, uh, and his parents were quite religious. In fact, his father was a pastor, and there's a lot of suggestion that his account was kind of filtered through the parents' uh, belief system. Um, that does not, of course, change the phenomena that he reported. Um, he did, uh, in fact, encounter some deceased relatives that he didn't know and so forth. So there are some phenomena that classify as, as a legitimate near-death experience, although the, the trappings may be colored by his, his family's belief system. Hi, I'm Nita Regal. I'm a retired nurse practitioner. Um, first, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Tucker's books for anybody who hasn't read them. They're really extraordinary, and I think it underscores the rigor of your research. But I have a question for Dr. Grayson. Um, when I was a, um, a nurse practicing in the coronary care unit, I had a few patients that I can recall that had or that talked about what sounded like near-death experiences, but there was one patient in particular that it was so disturbing. I mean, I still remember his name and the vision because it was really unsettling to him. It was not a pleasant experience. It was very, he actually saw on a rainy day, he had, it was during a cardiac arrest, he talked about being up in the room and being able to see things going on that were confirmed. 
But then he talked about this experience where he actually saw his funeral. It was a horse-drawn carriage. It was very, very unsettling to him. So it was not that peaceful, you know, sort of um, calming effect. Have you come across any experiences like that? I don't know if it was a near-death experience or not, but it was just very different from anything I'd ever heard. Yeah. There certainly are uh, a number of experiences that seem to qualify as near-death, but they are not pleasant. Um, we don't know how many there are because it's hard to get people to talk about these things. Most people who have studied the phenomena say that between 1 in 10 percent of people who have a near-death experience will have an unpleasant one, although again, it's hard to say because they don't talk about them. Um, Nancy Evans Bush, who herself had a terrifying experience, wrote a book about it called Dancing Past the Dark, in which she describes not only a range of unpleasant near-death experiences, but how to deal with them and how to make them into creative, positive experiences. Most uh, mythological uh, her hero's journeys include tra travels through terrifying travails to get to the final enlightenment or goal. And she tried to interpret it in, times, in terms of that, that some people need to go through these horrible things to get to the end point. Because we don't have many of these experiences to look at, we don't know what goes into making a near-death experience uh, pleasant or unpleasant. With some people, we know that what makes them unpleasant is the difficulty in letting go. And people who are very rigid personalities find themselves out of their bodies and are terrified by that experience. So instead of embracing the experience, they fight against it, and that itself makes it terrifying. But that's not the whole answer. I. Um, hi, I'm Mary Stack, and I very much believe in um, what you're talking about and done reading, different readings on it. And I remember, um, so Oliver Sacks, you know, his book, Hallucinations, he's poo-pooing this. What is your response to what he says? Um, Oliver Sacks uh, presents the, the standard materialistic position that the brain creates the mind, and he pretty much discounts all the phenomena that we, uh, that we look at and, and credit. And I don't know what his rationale is for discounting this, except that they don't agree with his, his worldview. Interestingly, he started one of his books, Musicophilia, which the near, with the near-death experience of Tony Sicoria, who was the uh, orthopedic surgeon in Rochester who had a near-death experience when he was struck by lightning and then had a total personality change. He started composing classical music, which he had never been involved with music before. Totally changed his life. And yet Sachs interpreted this as just um, an artifact of the brain frying, his, uh, his brain being fried by the, by the uh, electricity. Um, so, you know, I, I, I know that he knows of our work and he has read it and just thinks that's not worth paying attention to. I'm uh, Greg Patterson. I'm the Gamma Knife Nurse Coordinator here at UVA. Um, is your institute using anything to study like isochronic or binaural uh, acoustic waveforms to alter uh, mental status, such as in a lot of the popular literature, they're using theta waves, delta waves, um, to elicit um, out-of-body experiences, healing, changing um, brain chemistry, things of that nature. We're uh, certainly interested in that subject. I mean, one of the implications of the kind of psychological model that I sketched is that we potentially have access to all kinds of capabilities that normally we can't access. Sometimes people blunder into it, you know, through having a near-death encounter of some sort, uh, some through meditating for uh, decades. And maybe there are all kinds of other ways of accessing these things that we haven't found out about yet. You know, some kind of stimulation, whether, you know, electrical or magnetic stimulation of the brain directly or sound of one sort or another. I don't think anybody has uh, discovered anything like that yet that is really all that effective, but the possibilities are definitely there. I'm Anna Tate. I'm one of the um, abdominal transplant nurse practitioners here, um, and I, I had um, just a quick question. When you're talking about these near-death experiences that involve um, cardiac arrests or um, these anesthesia, sedative states, does that include studying patients that have been in um, like prolonged comas or um, ICU sedative states but have normal brain activity? Um, we have not studied people in prolonged coma um, 
simply because uh, we want people who have an acute event that we can look at before, during, and after. Uh, some people are. Stephen Laurie is at the University of Liège in Belgium, who has done a lot of the, the important work with people who seem to be in a persistent vegetative state. And if you talk to them, they can show physiological responses. He is now very interested in near-death experiences, and some of his grad students are working with me in, in collaborative research. Hello, I am Victoria, I am UVA student. I have a question. Is there a scientific explanation why people who experience clinical death have this, um, that some parts of their brain are activated or they have external powers? For example, in Russia, there are a lot of uh, psychic who see future, but majority of them, they had either trauma or they had coma and uh, do scientists explain what happens in the brain that after experiencing death, they have these powers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have the answer to that yet. We certainly have a lot of anecdotal <clears throat> evidence that people claim all sorts of abilities after the NDE that they didn't have before. Um, it's difficult to study these with neuroimaging, for example, because a lot of them can't do these things on demand. There have been a few people we studied in, in the lab that it has who claim to be able to do these things on demand, but to do most neuro neuroimaging uh, techniques, you have to be physically still while you're being imaged. And a lot of these people have trouble doing that. Uh, but we are still looking for people who can manifest these abilities at will um, that can do it in a way that we can do neuroimaging with. Hi, my name is um, Libby Rexroyd. I'm a nurse coordinator in the surgery department. Um, I'm just curious, how do you find your subjects? Do they come to you, or do you, are you uh, made aware of th these incidences, or uh, just, you know, how you come about finding them? Uh, well, th these days they find us. Uh, they go online, if, you know, if a child is talking about a past life, or if somebody has a, a near-death experience, or. Uh, extraordinary abilities, then they find Ed's lab, and so uh, we don't, it would be very hard to go out and find people, but fortunately it's very easy these days for them to find us. If I could uh, add to that, though, it's uh, the hardest part of our job is finding suitable people to work with in our lab. So if anybody knows of anybody who has uh, these kinds of <laughs> unusual skills, send them our way, please. Over so, here, uh, Dan Grogan. <clears throat> Unless I missed something, the only uh, percentile correlation you looked at was, or mentioned, was uh, cardiac events and trauma, suicide, war. Um, does that aspect, or I assume you were looking at the, the highest correlations, but connecting cause of death with uh, NDE, uh, NDE percentages, does that area lead you in any other direction or is there some your, what's the current theory about why that why those areas correlate and then I'd also be interested in your uh, view of the young man of James 3 and his personality or in the Western context um, rebirth or reincarnated folks um, what they bring to society after that in the arc of their life I'll take the NDE part first. We have studied, in, we have files of, of more than a thousand near-death experiences. About a quarter of those are from a cardiac arrest. Most of them are from other causes of death. The problem with a lot of these cases is that it's hard to know how close they were to death because they happened in a car accident or in safe places with them not being monitored. We like to study cardiac arrest because we know exactly what's going on with them. So we can get nice figures about that. Um, if you're looking at people who are in a car accident, we don't know what the baseline is, so we don't know how many of them have had NDEs. Uh, so it's, it's neater to do research with, with um, cardiac arrest, but we do study other people as well. And in fact, we have not found that the, the way you come close to death has any impact on the type of near-death experience that you're going to have. There are some exceptions, like people who are intoxicated at the time or under the effect of drugs tend not to have as many NDEs or to have shallower, quote, NDEs than people who are mentally clear at the time. 
so as far as the question of, of what children who remember past lives, sort of what they then take with them into their life, most of the children, by the time they get to be six or seven, stop talking about this stuff and then just go on with their lives, as far as we can tell. Now, some of them as adults say that it did give them more sort of a spiritual outlook. But, I mean, for the most part, they seem to be pretty much like the rest of us. Um, they're, not, so they're certainly not um, little mystics or anything like that. They're, they're just kind of <laughs> typical kids. We've done psychological testing with some of them. Uh, the only thing that really showed up is they tend to be quite intelligent, uh, but otherwise that they're pretty much just like everybody else. So we've come to the end of our hour, but obviously not to the end of your questions. So you'd be welcome to come down and talk with the presenters uh, following the program. We invite you to join us next week, uh, March 1st at 12 noon, please, because we're combined with Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, we have Gerald, Gerard Clancy here with us, who's president of the University of Tulsa in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's also a psychiatrist. Um, he will be talking about a story of success in reversing urban health disparities. So please join us then at noon next week. Please now join me in thanking members of the Division of Perceptual Studies for our fascinating hour. Thank you.